2002, the death of Max Perutz, one of the 20th century's greatest scientists, marked the end of an era. It seemed to me that the structure of protein was the crucial problem of biology. We had no idea what they looked like, how they worked. So I thought, have a crack at it. He was one of a brilliant group of Cambridge scientists who in the 1950s unlocked the secrets of life and founded the world-renowned Laboratory for Molecular Biology, the LMB. Since it was formed, LMB scientists have won 13 Nobel Prizes. Max himself was awarded a Nobel in 1962 for working out the structure of haemoglobin. He created a, a lab that, that it, it's difficult to uh, uh, live up to. In this program, scientists who knew and worked with Max talk to Professor Stephen Curry, a leading X-ray crystallographer from Imperial College London, about Max's life and scientific legacy. He brought in his letter to the Prime Minister's office turning down his knighthood. <laughs> ah. And I took this as a, a suggestion that you know, all future directors <laughs> should, <laughs> shouldn't accept knighthoods either. This programme contains previously unseen interviews with Max Perutz. I feel a little bit of an imposter here because I never uh, met Max, but it's really through learning about his science that actually made me get into the same field of mm. protein crystallography as him. So he's always been a sort of hero figure for me. I've read Georgina Ferry's uh, lovely biography, which came out fairly recently. She describes him as the founding father of molecular biology. Do you think that's a, a fair description of his contribution to Richard? What do you? When he started, he was very much. Um, looking for a project, and he found haemoglobin. He wanted something exciting and interesting, and then it sort of gradually grew. But his particular skill, I think, was he could spot talented people in important areas. Uh, for example, uh, Francis Crick, uh, uh, Jim Watson, and so on. Francis Crick was a graduate student of Max's, and James Watson was a postdoc in his lab. In 1953, they described the helical structure of DNA revolutionising our understanding of how life reproduces. He recognised that they were talented and then he supported them and, and in a way that allowed them to grow their own interests. Yes. So he was sort of the godfather of molecular biology. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. When he was starting to do his PhD when he came to Cambridge, I think under Bernal initially, yeah. um, and Bernal was very much into applying crystallography to biological problems. Max worked under one of the great pioneers of X-ray crystallography, J.D. Burnell, at Cambridge's Cavendish Laboratory in 1936. Burnell took some of the first X-ray photographs of protein crystals. I always say that, that Cambridge made me because, uh, I mean, people in Vienna did good work, but here in Cambridge they made great discoveries. And, um, you know, be, being in a place where people really discovered new and exciting things uh, made you think, well, if they can do it, why can't I? When I gave a haemoglobin crystal to Max Perutz 23 years ago, I didn't think I was putting him on a problem which would take the major part of his scientific life. But what a wonderful piece of work it has been. Max started work on the structure of haemoglobin in 1937, working with his graduate student and later colleague, John Kendrew. It was to take them until 1957 to complete the first low-resolution map of the molecule and until 1959 to solve the structure. You know, if anybody had said, it'll take you 22 years, but then you will have solved it, that would have been marvellous. In fact, I once dreamt I had solved the structure and then I woke up and it was so sad and disappointing that I hadn't. But the really tantalizing thing was that I had no idea if I ever would. In retrospect, you know, it looks as this marvelous persistence that could carry on like that, but let's say, I don't know, I carried on out of desperation. For those of you that remember him as the person, I mean, you've already spoken that he was bringing the best out in people. Kyosha, you worked with him, so what yes, was he I like as a mentor? 
he was interested in what everybody was doing, and he tried to learn even from students. You know, so <laughs> that, that was really great. In 1949, a new graduate student arrived to work with me on hemoglobin. The first result he showed me, he was a much better mathematician than I, was that my model was fundamentally flawed. Nowhere on the continent would a graduate student dare to uh, face his supervisor with a result that disproved the supervisor's most cherished result. But this is another great thing at, at Cambridge, that rank doesn't count. A student's word is as good as an ancient professor's. That trick of just asking questions and forcing you to articulate mm. your thoughts mm. was, of course, very yeah. good for you. Uh, it was, you know, he was interested, but in the process, you had to think your own thoughts through and uh, clarify them. And is that a culture that he tried to infuse? Asking questions in seminars, to, yeah, even I though you might know the answer, you ask it to, in Max's view, for the, for the benefit of the others. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that has come is that you can sit down and talk with people at all, all different levels of the organisation. I mean, even as a student there, I found that. So there is a really open culture, so everyone talks with everyone, and I think people, people help each other. Students help, postdocs who help, group leaders. I, I think you, know, you have to hand it to Max to get together such a powerful intellectual group of people and have them not fight with each other and not struggle for space or power or anything else, but simply to put science first. That was a very important achievement and that has persisted. We, we make our decisions really on the basis of what's best for the science. This spirit of collaboration is exemplified by Max's work when solving one of the hardest problems of crystallography, the phase problem. X-ray crystallography sends an X-ray beam through a crystallized molecule creating a diffraction pattern. The problem is that the diffraction pattern shows only the intensity of the waves. To work out the molecular structure, it is also necessary to know the phase. Bragg and I had a lot of discussions about other ways of solving the, the phase problem until I hit upon the right one in, in 1953 so si 16 years after I started, and that was the heavy atom method. Now, in 1939, uh, Bernal suggested that this uh, might also be applied to proteins, and we all thought that um, adding one heavy atom to, or two heavy atoms to a molecule with 10,000 light atoms would make no measurable difference to the intensities of the diffraction pattern. So I did these measurements and to my surprise I found that less than 1% of the atoms in the molecule contributed and that if I added a heavy atom all its electrons would be concentrated on a po at a point. They would all scatter in phase and so they should make a measurable difference. It was really one of the most moving moments in my whole scientific career. You know, Bragg was marvelous. I mean, he had spent a great deal of effort trying to think of ways of solving the phase problem. And he might have been disappointed that, that now I solved it alone, but not a bit of it. He went round the country telling everybody that I had discovered a gold mine. Do you think that's a rare attribute in directors of laboratories these days? <laughs> Speaking as a former No, no, no. I, I, I think it's one of the criteria in LMB. <laughs> everybody, students upwards, they want a director to listen to them and give absolutely 100% full attention to their project. <laughs> Whereas, you know, elsewhere you can often spend weeks trying to get an appointment to speak to you. Mm. So, you know, I think meeting mm. people three times a day in the canteen and so on. So I think Max was definitely the one who started that. Mm. He thought it was a very good thing if all the students, you know, younger scientists, saw the director working at the bench with test tubes and things like that. That would indicate to them that this was the most important thing and getting money and being famous and chatting wasn't the thing he should be aiming for. So I think he 
had that philosophy and it did carry on actually. Max handed over the directorship of the LMB in 1979, but continued to work in the lab until he died. Max often came up to the lab and he didn't have his own bench and so he asked, you know, can I use this much bench? And so um, my student, the postdoc, tried to surrender their bench, but you know, he always said this, this is enough. enough. <laughs> <laughs> As the current director, do you feel him standing at your shoulder? Do, do you feel that he's, he's something you have to live up to in that, in that sense? Uh, well, I think he created a, a lab that it's difficult to uh, live up to. I, I was asked yesterday why you won so many Nobel Prizes, and I simply said that it was peer pressure. And <laughs> that's, that's sort of true, actually, that, that, that once you've got that standard of serious intellectual endeavor, it's, uh, it carries on, and actually carries on from generation to generation. Could it be a modern sculpture? I wondered until an American friend sent me a photograph of a sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York with an object which had a shape, very similar shape to this and of course had been made several years before I built the hemoglobin molecule which uh, made me realize that the artist's imagination forestalls the shapes of nature which the scientist is going to unravel.